Here we go. Um, all right. So keep in mind the issues of authority, the corruptions. What happens when a religion becomes corrupted? And I think by the end, you can tell, you know, in another two weeks, you're going to understand that all of these traditions, the Christianity, Athenian democracy, the view of the healthy psyche there, um, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, they all involve these things. And the leaders, the people in charge, were all corrupted in very similar ways. And the leaders, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, all were critical of this. And um, some of them wanted to just start reform movements. They hadn't intended to start a new religion, but they were rejected by the establishment. And so they, um, it ended up forming into a new religion. Okay, so um, the Brahmins, the authorities, um, the rituals, okay, we all have rituals. So even if you're a humanist, and you consider yourself secular, still, you would have certain people who you consider authorities, you would ha hopefully have some rituals. Um, speculation, you would have a view of reality. And uh, Buddha, just says no authority, no rituals, no speculation. It's all about learning how to meditate and getting an intuitive sense of this is it. This is my calm place. Um, tradition, and there's no tradition. Uh, grace, the idea that there's always reason for hope. The universe is friendly. And so we should always be positive as opposed to fatalism. Um, and Buddha says, the grace comes within, within from your effort. You don't wait for some God to come up and do it for you. Um, and mystery, okay? There's no mystery. It all comes from within. So he's telling you, you can control your life, right? By controlling how you respond to life. Okay. Um, then there were these Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. So you could say that they're doctrines, but they're not really doctrines. They're just descriptions of life, right? They're descriptions um, of what the problem is and how to address it. They're all about ways of life. The concepts. Um, no soul, right? You, you try to just develop this real positive karma between you and the world so that you don't. Um, and then from there, you can decide how to, how to act, how to live. The characteristics are tested, um, empirically based, pragmatic, therapeutic. They work. Um, and then Zen Buddhism is, I don't know if you know about this, it was big in the 60s, um, but you would go to an ashram or a Buddhist area, and the, um, the monk would give you a koan, which would be something like, uh, what was the appearance of your face before you were born? Or it would be just some pretty absurd question, right? And you're supposed to meditate on it until that rational part of your psyche that has this desire to explain everything is just blown, right? It's trying to blow that part of your mind <laughs> so that you can get to the deeper part of the mind, right? And, I, and physiologically, you would say the corpus callosum, the front part, where we take in senses and where we do um, reasoning, calculating, all that stuff is, is blown, right? In order that the, the, the white matter, the stuff closer to the brain stem becomes active and is also developed, it's given more strength. 
And it can, and then it's also educated so that those impulses coming from the brainstem are trained, right? Not to act. The basic impulses are trained not to be impulsive. And so um, the way you have to put a lot of energy back into that part of your brain to get it so that it, you have enough energy there to be able to turn off all those instinctual drives. Um, so let's see, um, what else? That, that would be, that's where the article you, uh, um, legitimizes that. It explains that when you put electrodes on these uh, heads of meditating uh, monks, it actually does. It's amazing. Oh, it really does calm down. They weren't so dumb. All right, so we're going to look at black ink um, painting. So think about, right? Think about these things. Um, the color, what is the color? What is the design? What is, how is space um, used and dimension? The focal point, right? Check out, think about the focal point, the subject matter, and the relationship between human beings and nature, right? So keep that in mind because every painting has kind of these same themes. And then you think about, well, how does that reflect these beliefs? in no soul, right? Just, you know, there's nothing between you and what's out there. The four noble truths, life is suffering. The cause is desire. The cure is release from desire. And the treatment is the eightfold path, right mindedness, um, right concentration, okay? How does the art lead to this right mindfulness and right con uh, concentration to a deeper understanding of reality? So it's using, using visual images to get you to this non-visual place. Um, nirvana, how does the art try to get you to nirvana? Okay. Um, Finite objects are transitory, break the language barrier. Um, a person can appear to be doing all the same things, but they actually are doing them in an entirely different way. It's, it's not unlike the Bhagavad Gita where um, Arjuna had to go to war and he didn't want to and Krishna said, no, you just do it in an entirely different way where you stay in touch with the Atman Brahman. So um, this is, Buddha was Hindu and he broke off. He just focused completely on what he thought was the essence of the Hindu way of life was meditation. Um, and then the image of the raft and um, the image of the crossing of the river. So that's a big deal in these paintings because it's a big deal in Buddhism. So um, what, if you're a Christian, it's uh, the cross, right? What does the cross mean, right? So, um, okay. Then I will go to the pictures. Um, here we go, okay. So think about the color, the sense of space, the way space is used. The, let me see, I'll make sure I've got my whole list. Um, the design, the, um, the focal point, the subject matter, and the relationship between humans and nature. And if you stare, you know, if you create this painting or if you stare at it long enough, what do you think? Do you think you understand um, how it's trying to produce this 
state of being that you would call no soul um, or nirvana or getting over desire, right? So there's one and they're, they're similar. Okay, oh yeah, so I'm gonna read to you from um, the wisdom of the Buddha and then you can understand how um, the paintings are made by people who know this book pretty well. All that we are is the result of what we've thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. If a man speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows him as the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draw, draws the carriage. All that we are is the result of what we've thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. If a person speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him like a shadow that never leaves him. Hatred does not cease by hatred. Hatred ceases by love. This is an old rule. He who lives looking for pleasure only, his sense is uncontrolled, um, immoderate in his food, idle and weak. Mara, the tempter, will certainly overthrow him as the winds throws down a weak tree. He who lives without looking for pleasures, his sense is well controlled, moderate in his food, faithful and strong, him Mara will certainly not control any more than the wind throws down a rocky mountain. So they're always using an image of nature. Okay, here's another good one. As the rain, as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-thatched house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. Um, let's see, the thoughtless man. Here's another one about doctrine because we have we um, have thought, I mean, I've thought a lot about or I've talked a lot about each religion has certain doctrines, but the religious leaders, the spiritual icons really rejected an obsession with doctrine. The thoughtless person, even if he can recite a large portion of the law, but is not a doer of it, has no share in the priesthood, but is like a cow herd counting the cows of others. The follower of the law, even if he can recite only a small portion of the law, but having forsaken passion and hatred and foolishness, possesses true knowledge and serenity of mind. He, caring for nothing in this world or that to come, has indeed a share in the priesthood. Okay, there's another one. Um, let me find one. Oh, this one, it's hard to notice, but there's the little hut, <laughs> the little thatched roof there. It's there. Um, okay, and here, look at that bridge, the crossing. Uh, Buddha is called the, the bridge, the um, person who helps you cross uh, the bridge. I can't remember the moment. By rousing oneself by earnestness, the wise person may make for himself an island which no flood can overcome. So here, this person is on an island, okay? Um, when a learned person drives away vanity by earnestness, he, the wise, she, they, <laughs> climbing the terraced heights of wisdom, looks down upon others. Free from sorrow, he looks upon the sorrowing crowd as one that stands on a mountain looks down upon them that stand upon the plain. So this is an image of what it is that you should, you can do psychologically just as you go through life. Um, okay, 
took three miles. Okay. He, she, okay. They who take refuge with the Buddha, the law, and the church. They who see the four holy truths. That is the safe refuge. That is the best refuge. Okay. That's Oh yeah, all right. So here's a, a big one. Uh, there, there he's standing on the mountain, right? And he's, look at where the relation between humans and the natural world. Uh, I think it's amazing. And then it is an object of meditation when you stand in front of a 30 foot painting like that. Um, Okay, here's one. Um, if the Brahma has reached the other shore in both laws, in restraint and contemplation, all bonds vanish from them who has obtained knowledge. They for whom there's neither the hither nor the further shore, nor both them, the fearless and unshackled, I indeed call a Brahman. So here's the, the wise person. I also like these paintings because the person clearly, it looks like the rock over there. And then the stick that he's holding looks like this tree trunk over here. So he's definitely a microcosm in the macrocosm. Um, let's see, uh, the person, okay. The person who uh, has planted hair and becomes a Brahmin by his family or birth uh, is not a Brahmin. The person who wears dirty raiments, who is emaciated and covered with veins, who meditates alone in the forest, that person I call the Brahmin. I call the Brahmin one who does not cling to sensual pleasures like water on a lotus leaf. So the lotus is another big Buddhist symbol because um, he's often meditating on a lotus. His first sermon, he held out a lotus flower and just waited for somebody, just waited. And um, the and somebody got it, like, oh, I get it. I get what he's saying. There's a Buddha nature in everything. You don't talk about it. You see it, right? It's just you get the Atman Brahman at the source of everything. Um, let's see, one more thing. Them I called a Brahma who has traversed the miry road, the impassable world, and its vanity, who has gone through and reached the other shore, is thoughtful, steadfast, free from doubts, free from attachment and contempt. So there he is. Um, here's another, here's another one. It's hard to see, but he this person again, the stick is imitating. I mean, he his head. He looks kind of like that mountain there. And there, I think the artist wanted the person to blend in really well. And then the other part, oh, this has got cut off. Uh, I, keep, I keep getting these things cut off. Let me see, here we go. So you look at a bird and, and you look at it from the point of view of its Buddha nature, right? It's its connection to the Brahman, to the energy of the universe. So it's not at all scientifically accurate, but it gives you, you know, you know what it is and it, and you're supposed to just get in touch with what it really is, right? Not what it looks. And this is my favorite, uh, the mice, the Buddha, the Buddha mice. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you just think about how, many, how few strokes of the pen are needed and, you know, you can get it, you can visualize, you know what it is, but also it's, whoops, 
deliberately leading you to something beyond itself. And you can figure out that it is also. Um, so let me try the, the last ones. I'll give you 10 more, but I'll have to go fast. Um, this is the lotus because the lotus reminds Buddhists of um, Buddha on a lotus flower um, and then the lotus sermon. These are um, Zen Buddhist gardens. I recommend that you go and see one. And it's very, again, it's very meditative to walk through the garden. Um, and the, the paintings look like the gardens, right? This looks like the painting. So it's all set up for you to have the same type of experience. Um, and then the tea ceremony is a ritual intended to get you, you know, calm down in touch with the, the Buddha, um, Buddha nature. Um, I can't remember what else I was going to say, but all right. So I think we'll go through the first round of student reactions. So what did you think of that? What do you think of those paintings, um, Rasa? Well, um, so can I talk not specifically about those paintings? Can it be about like um, Buddhist paintings that I see? So typically when I go to pagodas, a lot of the paintings are colorful and intricate and each painting is like a whole wall. It's really massive and it, it gives you... Um, like each like each wall gives you a different feeling but all the feelings are the same in the sense that it's it makes your mind at ease and peaceful and what well, every time i go to the pagoda and stares at the painting although like i don't like i sometimes i i keep saying that i don't I'm not a Buddhist and I don't really connect to the paintings but then when you you stand in front of it and when like I I like like move my eyes like from the top to the bottom it somehow it relaxes my mind and it lets me like stay free of my thoughts and I I feel like I'm in the moment right there and so I feel like sometimes it's powerful that like a painting can do that to you. Oh yeah, remember uh, Houston Smith says it's empirical, right? It's been proven, yeah. it works. It's been well tested. So, um, Samantha. Hi, Professor. Hi. Um, I think the painting that stood out to me the most was the one with the house. And it was the um, idea of an unpatched house versus a strong house, a patched house, and that how passion, if you're house is basically patched up, can break through easily versus an unpatched house. It doesn't do that. And it really reminded me of the idea of like a strong mind in the control of when to react to certain things. And it just really jumped out to me. And I thought a lot of the paintings were beautiful. Um, I really like art history. And so that was one of the things that I thought was really interesting, just looking at all the different paintings. Good, yeah. I think I learned my philosophy through art because my mother took us to all this stuff when we went to Europe. And I, 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 that's just the way I was. I just remember standing in front of paintings and things. And then that was the way most people got their philosophy, right? It was through the arts. Yeah, so that's good. Um, Shamima. Nope. Uh, Blaine? Hello. Hi. Um, I don't really have any like specific one of those paintings that like caught my eye necessarily. I more so just wanted to kind of contrast, like compare and contrast something. So like in almost all of them, it shows Buddha or whoever the, the focus of the story happens to be. It shows humans living with nature in conjunction like they're together they work together like they're or, okay so there's the the second one it has a house surrounded by the trees it's like built into the mountain or uh the one where he's at the waterfall or the one where he's standing with the big trees like it's always him 
with or whoever the person is with nature but um the contrast is with the bible uh i remember <laughs> many times as a child um i would always get uh genesis quoted at me um and it was that god created um the garden of eden created adam pulled out a rib made him eve for company uh and then made a whole bunch of animals for adam to be the master of so adam was the master of the the garden of the animals so he was so like the position is that he is above nature and above all this life and that i think that ties into the whole made in god's image kind of thing a little, little bit on the huber side whereas with buddhism it's like we're on equal footing with nature or the same level right so do the people you know use genesis to justify that we that we don't have to care about environmental destruction because it's about whenever they're referencing it they're not they weren't referencing that it was more so um like most of the the ones who spouted Genesis at me, those were mainly the ones from like my home church whenever I was a kid. And that was whenever like uh, veganism and like that, that was super huge, but not like the good or the, the quote unquote normal kind of veganism, the ones who like get in your face and say that you need to be vegan kind of thing. And they were really taken aback by that. And they hated it. So then they used Genesis to defend themselves. So like, God told me that I'm the master of all these animals. That means that we can live in harmony, but I'll kill them for food. And then they used Genesis to back them up. Yeah, okay. Um, there is going to be a lot of that, though, because it's going to be those socialists and atheists who care about this. Um, and then revel the book of revelation right it's the end times so i'm sure there'll be a lot of people that don't pay attention or don't care it's kind of scary but anyway as long as you're prepared and you can try to communicate it's always important to try to communicate um aiden hey dr Beck, can you hear me yes So my takeaways from it, um, so a little bit of what uh, Wayne was saying. I like that it incorporates nature in pretty much all of them, um, mostly because I feel like a lot of Hinduism and Buddhism is about like your connection with everything. And I think nature is a good way of showing a connection with everything just because we're all a part of nature. And then also um, another contrast that I like with Buddhism well with these is um like with christianity christianity's art it's very obvious that it's christianity's art it has jesus or a cross or the virgin mary just pretty much anything but with this um, a lot of them you wouldn't know it's hinduism or buddhist it you know it just looks like nature it just looks like trees and mountains cabin but um the meaning behind it um, that isn't obvious, I think is just really beautiful. And um, I think it allows anybody to connect with it, even if you aren't Hinduist or right. Buddhist. But like with Christianity, if you're not Christian, it's harder for you to connect. Right, good. Um, yeah, and the whole notion of a crucifixion, you know, the death, the whole point is you get resurrected, right? Oh my God, you know, and that's unnatural, right? That's what you have to believe. Um, whereas with Hindu and Buddhist, it's, you know, it's consistent with uh, science to say that you go back into the big energy, right? Um, and let's see, what else? Oh, I, yeah, Christianity doesn't have to be anti-nature. I used to, you know, Jesus had those parables where he used natural images, the sower and the lilies of the field and things.
but it it does it is at this historical moment it's tending to get caught houston smith himself called himself a methodist buddhist <laughs> so you can be a methodist buddhist if you want to um who else let's see uh liam okay i have been lost in thought because a i like buddhist artwork i uh, I kind of started looking for posters that I could put in my room. Not gonna lie, <laughs> um, but the little bit that I do know about art from all of my scribbles from elementary school is is not good enough to really appreciate it. Though I can understand the kind of blending between the human and nature, which is done through the color palette and the like different brush strokes which is also just a kind of a byproduct of the culture that produces the artwork. I think that the palette and strokes are a massive part of the artwork. And that's kind of what I've been focusing on because the technique of the art I think is really important along with the actual meaning. Well, the actual um, activity of creating one is a meditative practice, right? So the artist has to put himself in a meditative state or herself while they're doing the art. Um, does that make sense that you would, that that would be kind yeah. of thing? It's like those little Zen gardens. You just get your little rake and just make the stroke back and forth until it's perfect. Oh gosh, you guys, you all have to go to a Zen garden. There's one in St. Louis, not too far from Batesville, but. Anyway, um, Nahida. Yes, ma'am. So I think this art shows their traditional exercise, such as meditation. So I think those arts reveals insights into the nature of reality or consciousness. So it is a practice of appreciating simplicity. From your explanation, um, what I, think this arts upholds spirituality and everyday culture. Okay. So I hope you're developing your own view of what the word spirit means and spirituality, right? It's it, you know, you can each come up with your own view, but we're definitely using that word in a way that isn't anti-science. Okay. Giovanni. Um, for me, I didn't really have like much of a reaction, but kind of like the same thing along with what, um, I forgot her name, but it was more of like, I'm kind of am amazed that like you can get such reactions from just something small as a, a picture, you know? And it goes to show that like, no, no matter like what, what you believe in or what you look up to, like it can be something as small as a, a picture or it can go as far as being a person. But like, as long as you have that faith and that belief in it, like that, that's all, that's enough, you know, like that's all you need. Also, it's calculated to, to resonate with a part of your brain too. So yeah. in a way, all you have to do is be open and it will do his work. Exactly. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Kasturi? Um, I think that art is an important aspect of expressing um, reality that each of us go through. So I think that uh, whenever we go through the images uh, that are related to Buddha, uh, those images are mostly related to uh, meditation and uh, the process that Buddha went through in order to achieve enlightenment. And yeah, it's amazing to uh, see images that will teach us uh, important things because like um, sometimes we just fail to understand the images that we are provided with. For instance, uh, you just showed one image where uh, there was uh, there was a Brahmin and we uh, we could, I mean, I could barely see that because 
um, uh, most of the time, what we notice is uh, we uh, we notice the bigger uh, bigger uh, things that has been expressed in images, and uh, I'm not really sure whether it is true or not uh, regarding what you spoke about Brahmin that um, Brahmins are not the ones who are born in a family of Brahmin rather than rather they are ones who who meditate in forest and uh, get enlightened but then yeah I think that uh, uh, arts especially visual arts they play significant role in uh, portraying uh, important lessons of life to human beings yeah I think I was just reading from the book and I think he meant yeah that the real Brahmins are the ones that are on the spiritual quest um oh okay actually I misread it a man does not become a Brahmin by his hair his family or his birth right so <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I, I just read it wrong. He becomes a Brahmin by his effort, right? By his search for enlightenment. So good. Uh, Untari. Mm. Hi, Professor. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I don't really have a reaction because I'm really blind about art, especially painting. I don't understand a single thing when you show those painting in the class um, and I'm just enjoying your in interpretation of the art and how you connect the human with the nature based on your interpretation. But it seems to me like Zen Buddhism is not relying on words, but more to uh, but directly to human understanding by saying it into one's nature if that makes sense to you yeah actually yeah yeah and i also realize how the mice painting is your favorite because uh, because how simple it was yet it success giving us the idea of what it was right yeah yeah i just like the way it calms your mind down right mm. and it, it does, I think it just gives you some sense of peace and that you are tied to the universe, you know? So I like that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Shanaz? Is she there? Okay. Thomas. Hey. So for me, the painting that stood out particularly just the one that was my favorite was the one of the little mice or rats or whatever little <laughs> people were. Mice. I thought it was cute. Okay. But um, what really kind of caught my attention while you were reading out the poetry and kind of like the, the teachings was the one about the tree that uh, suffers from great wind and gets knocked over. Because that reminded me, and I know a lot of people talk about Christianity now, but that's just what I learned growing up. It reminds me of Psalms 1, uh, 1 through 3 which talks about a tree planted by the river who will never cease to bear fruit, but it's more tying in um, the tree with, you know, belief in God and following his teachings and the rest of the Psalms, because the Psalms in general are both literal songs and their poetry that gives lessons. And uh, I just thought it was interesting that there were a lot of similarities between that. I mean, it also has to do with like Jeremiah 17, three, which also has to do about a tree that goes near a river and how it will never stop to bear stop bearing fruit even during years of drought. I just thought that was um, kind of interesting. Okay, good. Um, Poonam. Okay. Yes, Professor. Yep. Uh, so Professor, I think the picture says like, um, the pictures are, what to say? I'm sorry, Professor, I can't explain those pictures. Okay, Haley. Um, I think most of them are just trying to show that we are one with nature, or even that nature is like 
the bigger picture compared to us. And a lot of them have the same like colors and place dimensions. I don't know a lot about art. It does seem pretty peaceful. Okay, now we will do the article on women because this is a, a whole different way to think about Buddhism. And I, I think it's important, right, to make sure to think about a, a tradition from a lot of different points of view. Um, and this is pretty much the opposite. It's concerned with social justice, right? So the art was focused on meditation. And this one tends to be critical when the tradition is too focused on people getting inner peace and they're ignoring some really, really serious problems. Uh, around the country. I don't know if I told you this before, but I was flying back. I was flying from Indonesia to um, Vietnam. And I was sitting next to this guy about late 20s. And I just asked him, you know, why, where are you going? And what he said, oh, he and his friends come meet there for fun times for a week or two. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and I think he talked about drinking, but I mean, it just occurred to me, I might be sitting next to this guy who's going to be, you know, is going to have, be having sex with prostitutes or kids for the next week, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, he was a little bit shady character. I it was just really uncomfortable. But it's such an incredible business, right? Lots of money. So um, this is a, a serious problem. And then the, the Buddhists, the monks have been too complacent, right? That's what he's saying. They're too focused on meditation. They don't become activists enough. Um, Buddhism itself is was an activist, you know, it was trying to break down a lot of social barriers, but it did it through its teachings rather than literally getting out in the street and demonstrating or something. Um, women can achieve nirvana. That was so radical. Um, Buddha's aunt uh, was uh, ordained a monk at first. Okay, there's a story that at first he resisted. But again, these stories were told way after Buddha lived. And so the people who make up these stories have their own agendas. And that's true when you study the gospels, you do have to study who wrote them and did they have an agenda, especially the gospel of John. Um, but the, the, there is a tradition where becoming a nun is a great opportunity for women to become independent, to become educated. Um, so in the case of Buddhist nun, it's the first time institutionalization of independent religious life. But I, the nuns that I live with uh, could have chosen between getting married and have 12 kids and that's your life, or they became nuns and some of them went to Europe and got PhDs. Um, these are women who are now, a lot of them are dead actually, but they would have been about 90 years old. So they were born in the early 1900s. So, so um, I do hope people get in their head a picture of nuns, aren't just subservient little women who you know, work in hospitals and maybe teach. They're, they're pretty independent uh, women. Okay, the eight rules, they were attributed to Buddha. Remember, we had the same thing with Hindu. They're imposed on the nuns. They're told, the nuns are told to be subservient. They can't complain. Uh, it's the same old, same old. Supposedly, Buddha said this, but... Um, uh, the scriptures are written 400 years after he was born. So, I mean, I really don't think, or after he died, I do not think they're literal quotes, right? I think people are using, they're hiding behind. Buddha said, 
to to control things the way they want it. All right. Uh, there's this history in Thailand. Men worked away from home, so um, women were independent. But um, the Thai men then made use of prostitutes, so it became. It just continues to be a tradition. And now it's become an international business where people who are looking for that will go to Thailand and they can fix you up, right? They've got it all organized. Um, this section is about the relation between class and religion. Um, the prophetic religions, lower class people tends to tend to anticipate a coming messiah right and again we're going to find that all over the world with the climate catastrophes i'm sure every tradition will have a branch that says oh it's the end times um and doesn't do anything um and and really starts converting people to their religion um and then the privileged class always focuses on uh, that we were born privileged because of our previous life, or we deserve the privilege because we worked hard, or, I mean, in, in America, I'm sorry, but there's plenty of people like my son-in-law, I deserve these millions of dollars because my grandpa invented uh, refrigeration or whatever, uh, <laughs> whatever, right? It's always, um, there's some, uh some he doesn't use god to justify that though <laughs> there's using god to to justify your privilege i deserved it for some reason um so is buddhism too centered on personal cultivation um and religion and globalization so what's happening with religion and globalization um there's a focus on consumer goods um, agribusiness, family farms versus family farms closing down. The seeds are, there's monopolies on seeds. Um, governments are run by the elites who control elections, who get, make deals with uh, corporate, international corporations. What I'm worried about is that the summit last week or that just ended i mean i honestly think there were probably more fossil fuel promoting deals made than climate change um renewable deals that were made there were 500 lobbyists from fossil fuel companies so they would go and they would meet with all these politicians all over the world and say, look, if you let us ex you know, explore your country for oil or minerals or gas or whatever, you know, we can make a deal, you can get jobs, and people in developing countries aren't going to say no, because if they do it, they'll get reelected. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I hope not, you know, but when I heard that 500 lobbyists, that was incredible. So this is a problem, um, the problem with globalization and then hiding behind religion. So we also have to watch out with the way religion gets used as a tool by politicians to manipulate people or to pit people against each other. What, is, what about the religion of the market, right? Has the marketplace become its own religion. I know that in Indonesia, everywhere you go, there are these huge shopping malls and the people I lived with wanted to go there sometimes. And I just, I hated it. I did not want to go there. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I spell mall with a U, M-A-U-L, I can't take it. Um, Okay, so ritual practices get surrounded by consumption or um, churches or whatever use, you know, spend money so that their churches look like 
you know, something, you know, a material product. They have to be pretty or they have to be whatever. And it's corrupt. You're worshiping the appearance rather than the reality. Um, so how do each religion has to respond to the new religion of money? And how should Buddhism address the problem of prostitution? Um, yeah, I, I heard a lecture I, by a woman who was working on this in, when I was in um, Vietnam. That was her full right to work with these girls who were getting taken out of that. Um, but I, I know about a guy who helped this girl go back home, but her mother, I think the family was humiliated by that. She got into a fight with her mother and she ran back to the prostitute because the woman who ran it was nice to her. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. So, um, so there's just a lot of corrupting influences. But one, one way is for them to become nuns. They can get educated, get skills. Um, but yeah, okay. All right. Now, each person should pick out something that what they learned the most from the article. Rossi, go ahead. Um, so related to Buddhism and women, I want to discuss about how Buddhism says that it is wrong to sell one's daughter to get material goods. I feel like a lot of Cambodians don't care about this because um, it is seen through the form of dowry, like um, the bride's parents requires the groom's parents to provide them with a large amount of money as dowry so that um, the uh, couples can get married. And I feel like this is, um, it's not explicit that they are um, like selling their, oh, like that they're like selling their daughter for materials good, but it is true. They will not let them get married unless they get like at least $10,000 as a dowry and in Cambodia, that's a, a lot of money. And that's just like the minimum 10,000. That's like, um, if that family grew up, like not too rich, but if you right. are like middle-class or rich, it's more than $10,000. Who gets the money? The grooms, oh no, the bride's parents. Really? So the groom, yeah, the groom's family has to give the money to the bride's family. Oh, that's the opposite of, that's the opposite of, yeah, okay. it, it's the opposite of a lot of other like Southeast Asian or a or like South Asian countries. Before it used to be the women who's giving it, but then they change it so the men are giving it. But like still they are selling their daughter like for that money because they won't allow her to get married. And I feel like um, it's no different from like just buying like food and stuff because they they do it for the money and the absurd thing is during a lot of the weddings like they invite buddhist monks to come over and like celebrate and like give out the blessings yet the monks never discuss the topic that they shouldn't like they, sh they never discuss about the dowry topic in general and how like giving out or demanding dowry is a form of selling the daughter so it's just absurd that it's part of the buddhist like doctrine yet no one ever talks about it and it's just accepted yeah i a lot of my students tell stories about that um aiden well, i have a quick question about that what determines like the woman's value Wait, what was your question again, Aiden? Like you said that they're like purchasing a wife. What determines the value of the person? It's more like um her education, her family background. So say for example, me take me for example, um 
I would say I come from a middle class family then. Um, um, my grandfather is in like the government. He works in the government. And so based on my grandfather's background and my education, getting a bachelor's degree, I am like given more value. So like, I would say it will be like at least 50,000 or something. <laughs> but then if you grew up as like, in a farming like household that is um <laughs> where um you don't get much education say you finish like just grade 12 and your family are not well off the dowry would be between five thousand to ten thousand dollars and so i just find it absurd that um people like like kind of like treat us like a product um based on like a bunch of characteristics so yeah Right. Okay, I get it. So that's not uh, like a Buddhist or Hindu idea. It's not necessarily a Buddhist thing. It's more like a cultural like norm. Mm -hmm. But the absurd thing is that at those weddings, like Buddhist monks go to give blessings, yet they never discuss about the issue of dowry when like Buddhism says that one shouldn't sell their daughter for material goods. Yet dowry is a form of selling their daughters because they won't let her like marry someone she loved unless like they pay the money like pay the dowry so to me it's just a form of buying and selling that girl so yeah does the money go to the girl's family or does it go to the couple so they can start a house uh, it depends on the family but most of the time it goes to the girl's family unless like that parents are also educated. Um, so the case with like, so I, I, I wrote this in my post. So the case with my sister, like um, my parents didn't require a dowry, but uh, my parents require the groom's parents to pitch in into the wedding and um, provide like resources for my sister and my brother-in-law. So both my parents and the groom's parents like, pitch in like the money I think each of them give like five thousand or ten thousand dollars and so they use that for the wedding and then uh, give it to like my sister after her marriage so they can start a life but that's not like the typical case though <laughs> the typical case is that um that money goes straight to the girl's family and um they usually um use that money for the wedding but it's not all the money plus at the wedding like the guests who come they will give like the red envelope kind of and so like um they'll use the money so the money from the um like when people like the guests come so there are like thousands of guests coming so they'll use that money to pay off the wedding so the dowry kind of like is there for the parents to use for other things yeah I went to a wedding in Bangladesh. It was huge. It was depressing. <laughs> in a poor it's just country. too many people. Yeah. In, a, in a poor country. Anyway, Aiden, go ahead. Um, and then the reaction of what you're saying about people believing what they've heard. Um, I think that, because this is, you know, from a month ago, but I think that applies even more today with um, the internet. Than, well, I just the media in general. Because um, there's a lot of information out there that's false and uh, you really have to do your research about things, especially if you're speaking to it. Um, and then there's more information out there today than there is every day because of the internet. So, so, how, so how does that apply to the Buddhist, Buddha and women? Um, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I think I misinterpreted the question. <laughs> it was just you read the article about Buddhism and women, and then, you know, whatever struck you about it. But I can come back to you too, Aiden. Um, Samantha. Hi, Professor. So I think the thing that probably jumped out to me the most was just the high rates of HIV, I guess. I did not expect that when going over the article and the um, prostitution. I did not know that area was known for that. So that just kind of jumped out to me was kind of the big thing that I picked up from the article. And I just kind of found that very interesting. 
um, especially for the culture and it being heavily Buddhist. So that's what I found interesting about There's that. A lot of Westerners that go there, the guys are Americans and Europeans and stuff. So again, it's another kind of colonialism, you know? Um, all right, Shamima, are you there now? Yes, Professor. Okay, okay Professor, I, I want to read the Rajesh point. Like in my community also, it is like that. If like they told, we have to pay a lot of duty, for example, if I need to get married, I, First of all, I, I have to save a lot of money, otherwise I can. Because like in my community, me, like some girl still didn't get chance to get married because they demand from the Gomes family, they demand a lot of money. Before like first, they arranged the wedding ceremony. Second time, they came for the engagement. Third time, like we had three steps before getting married. So first time, Professor, they asked, they didn't ask those money in the engagement ceremony, like in front of or everyone, they asked like, for example, my, like my son is educated. So we are giving you this much school and you have to pay double, like you have to pay double, like, for my son, they demand like those kind of, for example, in Myanmar, like to six, like 10 lakhs, like 15 lakhs, we have to pay. And also sometimes we pay also gold to the doctors as well. Like example, my, my sister, my elder sister, she graduated and her with LLB law. And even though she's educated, and my family has to pay a lot of money. It is like okay, the, so it, yeah. In Islam, the the yeah. bride's daughter pays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. also, like in Islam, is demanded. Is is it says like it will be big sin if we give, if we will give those kind of money. But religions later, they whenever we went there, they said no. You just giving like your daughters and your son to eat, like to do something like for their life. They they have like this kind of rules, but people doesn't follow. If you will not give, no one will get you married. It's like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, Blaine. Hi, sorry, uh, Mike was having trouble. Um, yeah. Uh, my mine was kind of already said it was about the prostitution. Um, that that did surprise me. I um, though I did. I so whenever I was in high school, like my history and all that stuff, we went over for a while. We talked about uh, Vietnam, like the Vietnam uh, okay. War and all that stuff. Um, and. I know it's especially referenced to movies, but a big aspect of that was American soldiers would go over there, be there for who knows how long, and then they, yeah, prostitutes. Um, and that was like a big part of the culture surrounding the military. So the military who purchased the girls, that, that reminded me of Vietnam. But I'm just like, in Vietnam, there was like, not that it was a good reason, but there was a reason for that level of prostitution. Like the Americans, like they wanted, to, they were taking advantage of the girls, the girls were taking advantage of the opportunity or whatever ended up happening. But like, I just, I don't understand how and why it's that level and why so many are HIV positive and how it's allowed. It's just, and if they're complacent, that's just honestly a little appalling. Um, it was that tradition, though, you. of the men going away to work, right? And so, again, it was a kind of original economic compulsion turns into this other, morphs into something else. Um, yeah, okay. Let's see, I can't remember what I was going to say. Okay, Liam. 
I'm sorry. I have been lost in thought. What was the prompt again? Oh, actually, Blaine, I was going to say, I, I know people, right, who brought back the woman who was the prostitute and the kid. But I also know one of the students of Vietnam said the children that were uh, fathered by Americans who are still there, there's a stigma about them. There's a certain name for them, which, of course, you know, if you really think about it, it's just that it, it is amazing, you know, the legacy that you leave behind just by having sex a couple times with the prostitute, you know. Um, it is well, not just that, just the impression that America and America's military being everywhere. I mean, if if World War II hadn't happened and American soldiers hadn't have gone to uh, Japan and like stay there for a while, we wouldn't have gotten manga and then anime, which are huge parts of culture now. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of a, like a snowball effect. Right. History. That's why it is important what decisions you make because you do leave a legacy, right? There gets to be a history behind things. Um, good and bad sometimes. Um, so Liam, I just wanted whatever it was that you reacted to when you read the article about uh, Buddhism and women. Okay. Well, I don't remember my reaction because I read it at 3 a.m. And that is never a smart thing to do if you need to remember. But I am going to comment on parts of the conversation that we've had and the dowry thing, because all I really know how to relate it to is like Western dowries, like in medieval Europe, because it's always been like a, a more of a, an ownership thing, a way to demean women. And I think that um, even and a similarity between Eastern and Western religious practices for women is that they can both allow, like through being a nun or a monk, they can both allow for an emancipation of a woman, even though they are still dedicating themselves to an institution, like which would be either marriage or the religious stuff. Um, I forgot what point I was trying to make, but it allows for an emancipation and sort of an empowerment, but an empowerment through like subjugation, which is a strange thing to say, I think, but in my head, it makes sense. No, oh, it does. I mean, the nuns that I know, the Pope is sort of uh, like their alter ego, right? <laughs> He's there. But when there's a conservative one, they just ignore him or complain about him. And when there's a liberal one, you know, they like him. But it's always there, right? And they're aware of it. But they sort of become even more independent as a fight against it. Sometimes patriarchal traditions have the strongest women because they're like this, the under, they know the problem. And so they sort of empower each other. Um, but they still don't get to be priests and they still don't get to be bishops, you know, and it makes them mad. Um, Kasturi. Uh, professor, I'd like to react on the dowry system that Rasi talked about, because in most of the South Asian countries, including Nepal, uh, the practice is exactly opposite to what Rasi was saying. So um, here, uh, actually, the um, family of the girl, they are supposed to provide a dowry to the a boy's family. And uh, Yeah, and um, so uh, it depends on the provision of dowry. I mean, how much dowry does the girl's family has to provide to the boy's family depends upon the education level uh, uh, the um, boys has attended so far. Like Rasi was saying, uh, it depends upon how much educated she is or what position she is in her job. Uh, it actually depends like uh, what 
uh, to what extent does the person has to get respect in the society, right? So uh, in Nepal, uh, most of the um, things associated with dowry depends upon the education level, the uh, work, uh, the work that the person does. And another thing that I that I would like to talk about is. Uh, so it says that uh, in Buddhism, um, uh, like if uh, daughters earn money and give back to their family members, it is a indication of uh, showing respect towards the family. But then uh, I don't find it applicable in context of Nepal because uh, there are a lot of Buddhists in Nepal, but then uh, this is not applicable here because uh, although um, there are all there are a lot of Buddhists in Nepal and they actually um, they actually follow what's been written in the Buddhism books and other readings, but then uh, here we don't uh, we don't um, I mean it's we don't have that culture of. Uh, taking uh, money earned by uh, daughters you know like in nepal we think that uh, men they are supposed to work i mean they are supposed to do uh, works out of the house and females they mostly work inside the homes so i think because of these uh, conservative thoughts in people uh, we don't um, we don't uh, respect the culture okay. of that, that was just the money earned by the uh, females yeah that was just when they're prostitutes so maybe they you don't i mean obviously that not too many countries have as many prostitutes as thailand so yeah um untari yeah, yeah. i uh, so uh, sorry professor for the interruption so i actually read a novel when i was in high school so uh, it was related to prostitution in the u.s and um, I was so surprised because like, as you always say in most of the classes, like uh, whenever you are asked to give speech on US being the uh, very good country, but then, yeah, we mostly think that US is a uh, country that acts as the role model, role model for most of the countries in the world. But then when I go through stuff, related to us and they are negative and i find it so weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't look too carefully uh okay untari uh professor i just want to say something about your experience in indonesia and how it was related to how shopping mall is become a new religion in this globalization right uh, and i found myself agreed to that because people nowadays make it an obligation to go to shopping malls at least like every once in a month because my friend also do that. But I don't understand how, what makes you think that, what makes you think that to be considered as a new religion rituals? Oh, I, it's just um, if you care more about what you have than what you are or something. I mean, it's just about consumerism, materialism, mm -hmm. what your goals in life are. I mean, it's nothing, nothing particularly Indonesian. Um, it goes on all over the world, the way capitalism affects culture, I guess. Um, does that make sense, Untari? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, Professor. Nothing, no, no biggie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Shanaz, she there? Okay, Thomas. So, um, when I read the article, I kind of came to the same, not really conclusion as Leah, but I noticed similar things about how he talked about the emancipation of women kind of in the religion comes from selling yourself. And I just wanted to kind of comment on that because that caught my attention that the two solutions, you know, to not having money or, you know, being in need of money were, you know, prostitution, which was dangerous. And according to Buddhism, 
leads to getting more money to groom yourself and focus on yourself, which is, you know, that's not good. So it's not inherently the act that's wrong. It's the fact that it leads to things that are wrong, which I thought was interesting. But if you can't prostitute, in, not if you can't, if you shouldn't prostitute, it was become a nun, which offers you financial stability, the ability to marry, the ability to have and appear. <coughs> but it just seemed weird to me that, you know, your only option to escape, not necessarily poverty, but to become financially better and move up, you know, maybe in a social and economic class is to literally sell yourself in just a different way. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, you know, if you, if you're having to go into something of faith out of need and necessity financially, instead of a need and necessity emotionally or spiritually, then you really have to question how genuine you are about it. Because a lot of, you know, you know, drawing a comparison to nuns in the Catholic church, they are dedicating themselves quite literally to this life by going to, you know, all sorts of convents and just, you know, literally dedicating themselves to being a certain way. You can't really, you know, pretend to be that way. You don't yeah, just- Yeah, you don't have much property of your own, yeah, right? You do not. You don't really go into that to make money. So I just thought it was interesting that that is just accepted that you can become a nun or go down this religious path in order to better yourself, not necessarily because you are interested in the religious aspect of it. Actually, during the Middle Ages in, in Europe, um, people had huge families and one or two kids always ended up in the monasteries because of poverty, really. Um, so that was kind of standard practice. Um, it's just, yeah. The nice thing is when women actually also can get educated and they can have jobs and be independent and all that stuff. But a lot of it was just where to put a poor kid that you can't provide for. Um, Poonam. Yes, Professor. Professor, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Uh, professor, as Jesse said, that uh, um, in their country, uh, Buddhist uh, women are get dowry. So, like in, uh, like in my primary level, I also read that in Bangladesh, Buddhists are very small ethnic group. So, like I also read that uh, they are getting uh, the women are getting dowry in in Buddhist uh, Buddhist religion uh, and even uh, like uh, in our religion or other religion the son get the right of um, of all uh, all the right of for like the they get properties and everything but in buddhist uh, buddhism uh, the daughters get all the uh, right uh, like the properties and everything and in, in mostly in other religion uh, the men men are the their like they lead their family but in buddhist uh, the women lead their family i also read in my primary level book okay good all right so the next issue is um the Buddhism and meditation practices um, and Buddhism and the environment. So um, this is just quick, just to remind you of what it said, right? The articles weren't very long and Buddhism, again, an art. Um, and then uh, let's see, the Buddhism and the environment article and the outline, where's the outline? There it is. Um, but, okay. Oh, I did want to point out one other thing is comparing Buddha's idea of suffering, right? With this, this analysis of the different causes of suffering, right? And so this would be, this is more connected to, um, the West Seneca, it doesn't have to be. It's just sort of, I put this together, but there is a, a essay by Seneca called On Providence, and it is about suffering and human and unjust and just suffering. So, um, so you can think about this if you want, and then you can also compare that to um, what Buddha, you know, the Buddhist view about suffering. 
some suffering is the human condition. Some suffering is your own bad choices. Some suffering is other people's bad choices. Some suffering is institutionalized injustice, right? And that isn't caused by you. And how can you make those distinctions and things like that? So if any of you want to write about that, you know, comparing the Buddhist way of understanding and dealing with suffering versus um, this sort of way of analyzing the types and all that, you can do that. Um, so then there was this last thing about, I had the, the Hindu article, but the Buddhist attitude, and that shouldn't come as any surprise. Um, it's all about staying in touch with the universe and the use of resources, our attitudes toward the natural world, um, how we deal with pollution, um, nature, and needing right to um, reappraise your values and to, you know, <laughs> change. Um, so it would be a question of, do you think Buddhists will be at the forefront of climate change movements? Um, should they? Will they? Whatever. Or whatever you thought about that. Rossi, what would you like? Any comments? Either on the meditation part and the fact that it's been legitimized by science or on the, on the environmental stuff. Um, I would uh, have a say on the environmental part. So um, I support Buddhist attitude towards nature when it says that the world, nature, and mankind stands or falls with the type of um, moral or with the type of moral or oh, moral force at work. So um, there are cases proving um, Buddha's word to be true. Say, for example, ignorance leading to an epidemic. So we can see that in co uh, with COVID-19 case where a lot of countries do not take um, COVID-19 seriously at the start. And that's when they don't follow the protocols and safety prevention. So it leads to an epidemic and then a pandemic, which is even worse. And it has destroyed us in so many ways for the past two years. And another example is with um, saying how greed leads to famine. And that example is true during the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge soldiers were being greedy when, when they persist that the farmlands should produce at least three tons of rice per hectare. And so, they were greedy to a point that they just want to export everything and they don't care about their citizens who are the, oh, the laborers who are doing the work to grow the rice. So they, those people they didn't have anything to eat. They um, were hungry and they don't, uh, some places couldn't even grow the amount that was put for them. And that leads to farming in a lot of regions in Cambodia and the fact that they still pursue that three tons per hectare just came back as destruction and it's not something that is um like that they would say they are proud of like looking back yeah okay um samantha yes professor um so basically when i was kind of thinking about the readings and kind of what I was looking for for my topic. And I think one thing that's jumped out to me overall, oops, this whole kind of unit, the last couple of units overall is kind of the overall treatment of women throughout history, especially within these religions and ideologies. And so I was really kind of thinking of going that way with my paper, but um, we were just going over the one article about, um, whether not the topics, but the last paper before this with Buddhism and women, that kind of just stuck to me for a little bit. And so I just kind of that. And then I was thinking about what Blaine said about the history and um, Vietnam and kind of the US soldiers over there. I was just kind of thinking about that kind of construction for the paper, going kind of like bouncing around from like that. That's kind of what I've been thinking about for the past 10 minutes. My brain's kind of been, ooh, well, the story point. of Adam and Eve, I mean, so many of my students. Yeah that lion 
women are the cause of evil. Oh my God. I, so, whatever. Always blame the woman. Eh. Okay. Uh, Aiden. You got something, Aiden? You can go ahead. I I didn't read the right article. Um, I looked up a little bit about it and I can talk about that. And basically, it's just what um, everyone's been saying. Uh, I'm sure it's changed by now. Hopefully, it's changed by now. But it's obvious that, um, like, the foundation of Buddhism and you know, a lot of other things is really unfair to women. And just from what I've read, is um, it says that women were not even capable of becoming enlightened because they're women and they couldn't become enlightened unless they were born as a man. And that wasn't what Buddha said. That's the trouble, right? It, it was institutionalized after Buddha. Right. And I mean, I don't know what Buddha said, but just that idea in general is you know, a terrible idea. Um, I'm glad that you know we've evolved Right. Well, Buddha was about, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, he got over caste and race and gender, right? So he was very progressive. It's just that these sayings of Buddha that came up 400 years later, they have their own agenda. And that's, that's why institutionalized religion is very different than the original spirit, right? The spiritual life. Um, Blaine, did you have a reaction? We just have five minutes, so you can either be quick or pass or whatever. I'm going to pass. Okay, Liam? I'll pass. Really? You don't have to. We do have five minutes, but yeah. um, Kasturi? Uh, professor, we are talking about the uh, environment part, right? Right. <laughs> so I actually didn't get the opportunity to go through this part, but then That's uh, I think that uh, so uh, in this uh, in this outline, I mean in this article, we can we can see that uh, only God has absolute sovereignty over all creatures, humans and non-human beings as per Hinduism. And uh, so when uh, actually there is a book called Source Tani Brata Katha in Nepal. Uh, and uh, so there's a story um, where it says that uh, Lord Shiva, he is the he's the owner of each and everything that takes place here in Hinduism. And he actually created the entire um, entire world. He gave birth to uh, both, uh, I mean, he gave birth to uh, several demons uh, with the help of other gods as well. And uh, actually um, people, they die uh, with the, permission of him and other gods as well uh, so i think these things are myth but then <laughs> yeah it really interests me when i go through these uh, stories because like uh, there are a lot of sayings where it mentions that uh, most of the paths of nepal they are they were formed when um, the first wife of uh, siva called sati yeah, okay, I'm going yeah, to I'm gonna have to cut you off, though, but okay. um, because, you know, we got to we got to finish the last five students, but it is, you know, you do have to rethink the image in the back of your head that's just there because you grew up in a certain religion, right? So the Adam and Eve story means nothing to somebody else. Um, so that I do think in college, that's the time to sort of think about how much they've been influenced by this stuff and that stuff is relative there's other stuff right the virtues that isn't relative but uh the doctrines and the particular stories are so that's that's an important point um untari did you have any comment 
I will pass, Professor. Okay, Shanaz, are you there? Okay, Thomas. So for me, um, just a quick comment I'd like to make. As I'm hearing and learning more about Buddhism, I really think that it's going to be on the forefront coming with these next, you know, just few years as, you know, climate change and environmental impact is being, you know, brought rightfully so to, you know, the front of the world's issues. I think Buddhism is going to be one of the key religions in addressing it because very few religions are so cl closely tied in with nature as a whole as Buddhism. Plus the techniques for stress, right? Because people are going to have a lot more stress. Absolutely. Yeah. So that combination of stuff. Does that make sense to you, Thomas? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And people have said Buddhism is the religion of the future. Um, who knows? I mean, right now it's the autocrats that use religion as a weapon that are really winning the day at the moment. But yeah, long term. Um, Shamima? Is, are you yes, okay? Go ahead. Sorry, Professor, I actually didn't read this back. That's okay. Um, so again, Thomas, if you want to write your paper on that, if you wanted to do a little more research for your paper, um, again, I don't require it, but you just, you know, you can use a college class to, to justify. Um, okay, so everybody's done. And next week we start with Islam and the papers are due. And I would like to require you to come to paper conferences just to check with me, just explain your outline. I might be able to give you some quotes. I like to talk to students about their papers. I like to find out how they think um, and to think things through and things like that. I really enjoy that. So I am gonna require it because not too many people are having network problems. So I'm gonna have the usual office hours during this time, but I can come later for an hour and a half. I don't go to bed till one o'clock. And um, I could come earlier. I can come for the US students in the afternoon. So it's not hard to find a time. Anyway, have a nice weekend.